Hello, it's Kay from KCM here in a different environment. Um, I'm here today to talk about a few different things. Um, it's been quite a while now since the last KCM event, but um, <clears throat> ever since that event, I've been meaning to talk a little bit about what happened during the event and um, <clears throat> kind of some of the assumptions going into it and, and what we learned. Because, of course, every time I do an event, I learn things that I couldn't have imagined. So, um, the glasses are disgusting as well. So, uh, as a reminder, that event was for Kiel Holman. We did five different Kiel Holman whiskeys, and we had a special bottling that we were entertaining um, opening. And uh, so we ended up opening that bottle after all. Um, and... So I'm going to pour a little bit. I hope I don't go into a sneezing fit here because I've been doing a lot of that lately. <coughs> Good content. Um, <clears throat> so, a little bit on the Killed Holman. Um, we obviously, we had two versions of the 100% Isla. We had the uh, Sherry Cask. We had the Sorry, not the shirt cask, the pork cask, the red wine cask, and then the um, the 2009 bottling, which was not 100% Iowa, so it was that heavier peak content. Um, but we're going to do it, I had a few assumptions. The 6th edition 100% Iowa and the 7th edition 100% Iowa, one of my big assumptions going into it was that people, especially of a few of the people who are new to this, the whiskey tasting um, environment uh, would not be able to discern the difference. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting for those of us who are who participate in whiskey events or, or, you know, indulge in whiskey and then introduce new people to whiskey. One of the most common things that you hear is about how somebody is concerned that either the whiskey is too good for them or they will it'll be lost on them or you know they won't be able to appreciate it or they've never been able to tell the difference so um so we hear that a lot i hear that a ton when i'm um trying to get people engaged in in, in a whiskey tasting so with that said, this I felt that the 6th edition and the 7th edition were actually kind of challenging to discern the differences of. So uh, my worry was that uh, going into the tasting with these two back-to-back, -back, people would be uh, really intimidated or feel out of place. And that didn't happen. In fact, when we sat down and we talked about these two I found that a lot of people had more opinions on the differences than even I did, um, which was really encouraging and, and kind of eye-opening. Um, you don't want to frame it up as an expectation to your audience, but you also, you don't want to discredit them either. And a lot of times I think as whiskey tasters or people who, who host events for whiskey tasting, sometimes you, you kind of say, okay, well, I do this a lot, so you know, maybe I get it, but they won't, and, and you can be proven wrong. Uh, the stars of the show, the, the red cask, or the red wine cask, and then the pork cask were, it was pretty well anticipated. I think the pork cask was my favorite going into it, and that, that was something that was true for everybody involved, which was really interesting and, and very fun. Um, The other thing is, and a big thing I talked about going into the tasting was um, getting people not to rush or not to overdo it uh, with the the, um, the peaty flavor and the intensity of the peat. Um, 
I think we we did a pretty decent job. Maybe not an excellent job, but uh, from front to back, I think we maintained a good sampling size for um, every pour. I think we we it took quite a bit of reminding to keep people, you know, at fifty percent. Okay, add some water. Add a little bit more water. Don't be afraid to add water. It took quite a bit of coaxing to get people in, into the habit of doing that. Um, Kill Holman is quite a well-made whis whiskey, in my opinion. I mean, every bottle that I've had, last maybe one, has been um, just really, really enjoyable. And so... You know, it's easy to be comfortable at that 50% or whatever they bottle at. So, um, anyway, so I wanted, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about Octomore 8.1, which um, obviously was a big part of this. And I will say that. Prior to the event, I had not tried Octomore 8.1. It deserves its own review, which I will do. Um, not in this video, of course, but... Um, I, one thing that is always interesting, and for those of you who haven't had Octomore, um, there's an intimidation factor when you try peated whiskey because it is very polarizing. Um, but you have a high PPM, high proof whiskey that basically touts itself as the most peated single scotch in the, in the world. Um, that, that can add a lot of intimidation. And I think one, one of my concerns going into it was that people would be afraid to try it. But by the end of trying five different Kill Holmans, every person was chomping at the bit to get a taste for this. And resoundingly, everybody was enamored with this whiskey, which just speaks to Octomore, as gimmicky as it sounds, is not a gimmick whiskey. Octomore is just a bombshell. It's just so well-made, well-crafted, well-thought-out. And I can't speak for all Lactamore, obviously. This this whiskey, this Kilhoman, I'm drinking the sixth edition here. When you look at it compared to the Octomore 8.1, they're worlds apart. I mean, this is a great whiskey, and I, I feel very good about recommending it to anybody. But compared to the Octomore, it doesn't hold a candle. The Octomore has so much more depth, so much complexity. It is so well balanced. It it really the peat flavor isn't what you would expect when you hear what they talk about but it also isn't disappointing so they they deliver on that that peaty flavor and the peaty expectation um while simultaneously um creating a really unique and powerful experience that you just want to keep drinking it's an expensive whiskey for sure but in today's day and age, when you go out and you can spend $300 on a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label, um, or you can spend, you know, $150 on an 18 year old, whatever, Glenfiddich, Glenlivet, what have you, McAllen, you know, and then you have Octomore sitting over here. It's a no brainer. This should be your choice every time because the quality of the spirit, the, the complexity, the craftsmanship is obviously there. It's a passionate project. It's something that they really feel good about. And I watched they had a Scotch documentary in my last Delta flight that I watched. And they talked about the master distiller or the distiller at, at Brooklotti. And, um, you know, he had a lot of great things to say about this. And then he said, you know, his magnum opus was his, the Brooklady Black Art, which just made me say, okay, that's it. That we're, I'm trying that whiskey. Now, I don't know when, but at some point, 
Brooklady Black Art that's going to be on my list. Anyway, um, so resoundingly positive in the, you know, for all the newcomers, I think everybody enjoyed themselves. themselves. Uh, we had a few people who uh, didn't hold their liquor as well and had to, uh, had to get driven home, which was good. It was good that they were safe. Um, and ultimately, uh, even they were, they had positive things to say. Uh, it doesn't always work for everybody, and it shouldn't. I mean, it's not for everybody, but um, this, I would say, there's so much potential in peanut whiskey to show people elements and sides of it that, that they don't understand or they, they think they're, they're not um, prone to enjoy. I would encourage people to continue to learn more about it and, and experience new things because not all peat and whiskey is created equal and not all peat feels and tastes the same. So anyway, um, really excited for the next one. In the next video I post, I'm going to talk a little bit about what our next tasting is and what you can expect. Slancha, I hope you enjoy um, you can sometime in the future look forward to a review of this Octomore 8.1. I can't wait till I get another bottle of Octomore, and we'll see you next time.